weird, how weird, how weird. Let the spooky weirdness begin. Welcome back to 366weirdmovies.com. Weird View Crew and our very first edition of Hollow Weird, where we're going to be looking at just the weird horror movies for the month of October. And today's selection <laughs> is going to be kind of a mild one. Uh, to tell you the truth, it's not really a reader request per se, but I do see this movie brought up once in a while around the edges of weird movie discussions here and there in forums and comments and whatnot. And, um... The main reason I'm covering it today is just because I, I think this movie deserves to be at least remembered better. Uh, it really is forgotten. For one thing, it came out the banner year of 1984. Look at everything else that came out in 1984. There was Ghostbusters, there was Gremlins, there was the Indiana Jones franchise, and the very first Nightmare on Elm Street movie, all of which went on to greater sequels, greater fame. We still remember these movies today. As opposed to Dreamscape. 1984. <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, this movie got a little bit of buzz when it came out, and I opted to see it on cable when it came out, which was very soon after theaters. It wasn't quite a flop. It didn't really impress. And yet, it is a movie about uh, interconnected dreams. People who can go into each other's dreams using psychic powers, blah, blah. And... Um, so, that kind of puts it on our radar. Um, I honestly feel sorry for this movie because it was set up for weirdness, which was never realized. <laughs> and I think the studio kind of dumped it a little bit. It was 20th Century Fox. But anyway, Dreamscape 1984. And it also ticks me off just a little bit because this movie could have been so much more. And it really did not realize the point in history where it was, where it could have taken off and done somersaults and been amazing, okay? And instead, it just kind of sort of jogged to the finish line and went, <laughs> I did it. Anyway, it took a perfectly good premise and a perfectly good cast and just a drowned in apathy. But anyway, we're going to go ahead and cover it anyway just to get it out of the way so people don't ask about it again. And uh, the first place we're going to start here, Dreamscape. Uh, while it is an uncredited uh, uh, credit, the... Uh, movie is based on Roger Zelazny's outline derived from his short story, He Who Shapes, and from his novel, The Dream Master. Um, 20th Century Fox bought the outline, but then didn't credit him in the script, and they didn't really base the movie on his outline as much as just the general premise of it. Now, Roger Zelazny, <clears throat> noted science fiction author, was part of the 1960s New Wave, alumni of uh, Harlan Ellison's genre-defying anthology series, Dangerous Visions. Uh, he is the winner of three-time Nebula Award and six-time Hugo Awards. And uh, he wrote a lot of science fiction which mixed in uh, classical themes from mythology in his futuristic stories, not just Greek mythology, but Hindu, Chinese, Egyptian, all over the place. Uh, Zelazny was a very weird thinker, <laughs> very original. Uh, you may remember one of his more memorable stories titled The Doors of His Face, The Lamps of His Mouth, which is kind of a space-age Moby Dick story. So uh, Zelazny is certainly capable of thinking of weird things, and I think had this movie been a little more closer to his work, we might have actually seen something. So um, I'll say this much. The plot reads exactly like Zelazny just had a dream, sat up in bed, Reach for that notepad that all authors keep on the bedstand and jotted down Psychic Dream Warriors and then just went back to sleep. And in the morning, he just went, <laughs> Psychic Dream Warriors. Well, I'll just work backward from there. So the plot's basically invented to support that premise. All right, let's get into this cast because it's dynamite. Dennis Quaid up front. Uh, channeling Harrison Ford for some reason. <laughs> Kate Capshaw. Don't cringe, she's not playing her character Screamy from Temple of Doom. <laughs> so she plays a very level-headed character who's basically just here to be the generic love interest. Uh, Max von Sydow, who you know from The Seventh Seal. We have Christopher Plummer, uh, being his Christopher Plummerist. We have, again, Eddie Albert from Green Acres. <laughs> Are you all right, sir? Oh, boy. Did I have a nightmare. Okay, and uh, people who watch this channel also know Eddie Albert from her 
Devil's Rain review. Last time he was on our channel, the uh, he was going up against uh, Ernest Borgnine, who was uh, currently a goat. And <laughs> no, I'm not giving that any context. Finally, we have David Patrick Kelly uh, playing his usual villain role, and you'll per certainly not recognize him from. Warriors, come out to play. Uh, Warriors movie come out to play that guy okay um, dreamscape was directed by Joseph Rubin who also directed sleeping with the enemy and uh, it's kind of surprising that that isn't the title of this movie but anyway let's just breeze through a spoiler free light recap <clears throat> Dennis Quaid is Alex a dashing young psychic who is busy piddling away his gift by picking winning horses at the racetrack and getting into trouble with a local mob for cheating. Hello, Alex. Hi. Looking for me? <laughs> you could really hurt a guy's feelings. The way you've been trying to avoid me and all. We don't see you around the track that often. When we do, you're always calling them right on the nose. Alex is busy fleeing mobster hoodlums when he gets intercepted by spooky government guys. Well, there's some people up at Thornhill that are anxious to meet with you. Yeah, well, what would you do if I just opened the door and jumped, huh? I guess I'd have to stop you. Just sit back and enjoy the ride. Hey, answer me something. If I can. Am I in any danger? Not from us. He gets kidnapped and driven in this classic Ford Country Squire to the Thornhill Dream Institute. There he is forcibly recruited by his old scientist mentor, Dr. Novotny, played by Max von Sydow. Novotny. I should have known. You're nine years too late. You left me sitting in Chicago with an overheated biofeedback machine. Do you think next time you could spare me the cloak and dagger act? Oh, you mean you would have come if I just called? Novotny wants Alex to join his dark money government project, which is researching dream interaction. Basically, multiplayer dreaming. Wade plays this whole movie with a smirking rogue attitude ripped straight off Han Solo. He even dares to make a Star Wars joke. Who's your decorator? Darth Vader? Alex is resistant to Novotny's call to action, so he has to drag Alex to the village pub to soften him up over a couple pitchers of beer. Village pub! The generic local watering hole for all your movie's generic scenes. Let's pretend that a man, with a little help from science, could psychically project himself inside the dream of a sleeping person. Okay, let's pretend that. Then pretend that once inside the dream, he could become an active participant in it. Hmm? could actually be there, right in the middle. You could also get inside the subconscious mind, to the dreamscape. Title drop. Quay joins the research team and starts honing his psychic powers with the old mind-reading cards drill. Blue. Boom. There was a lot of this going around in 1984. Well, what's the point of this? I've done it a million times. You've got to sharpen your psychic abilities. You'll have to learn to reach a meditative state in which your mind can conform with the dreamers. Alex starts hitting on Jane, played with refreshing restraint by Cape Capshaw. <laughs> and, um, that's about as far as that's gonna go. Also at the Institute is Tommy, David Patrick Kelly's character in full villain mode, who lets Alex know right away he has it in for him. Novotny gives me free reign, no way? Must be your sparkling personality. Because I'm the only guy, Alex. I'm the only guy who can do it. What about Edward Sims? They had to carry him away in a basket. Yeah, well, Novotny seems to think I'll be able to do it. I'll order your basket. Tommy is another psychic researching dream interaction, but he has turned to the dark side of the force. 
And at last we have Christopher Plummer playing Bob Blair, a high up powerful government guy whose exact position and rank is never divulged. He may have some sinister intentions in this project. So what's going on here? Psychic dream researchers are useful for subconscious errands like freeing children from their nightmare monsters. Alex meets this little guy, Buddy, and vows to help him fight his nightmare monster, a snake man. There. Are you sure, Alex? He's always there. <laughs> That's my dad, but he won't help us. The little bastard's right. But hey, we almost forgot there was Eddie Albert in this movie. He is playing the president. That's right, the president of the United States. Look, it was 1984. Old comedy actors playing presidents was a thing. Everybody accepted it then. The president is having nightmares about a coming nuclear summit where he fears that he's going to cause World War III. We're all missing that Cold War paranoia a lot these days, aren't we guys? Bob Blair wants to bring in the president to research his dreams, which Novotny is reluctant to take on. But look out, here's an incoming Norm cameo out of nowhere. <laughs> Alex meets him at the village pub. When your protagonist needs a tip from an anonymous source to get the plot rolling, come to the Village Pub. Look, they even sell t-shirts with their distinctive plain text logo and their popular orange color. How else are you going to show all your friends that you have visited the world famous Village Pub? Norm, it turns out, is a horror author named Charlie Prince. But Alex had to ask him who he is because he didn't recognize him. So I guess Village Pub is the bar where nobody knows your name. <laughs> Prince is doing some research for his next novel, About Nightmares, oh, what a coincidence, and he has some juicy inside info about Bob Blair. I assume you've run into a tough, smooth, corporate type named Bob Blair. You want to guess what he does? He's with the government, right? He's more than just with the government. He's one of the most powerful men in it, head of covert intelligence. The president's come and go. Bob Blair remains might have evil intentions, but nothing specific yet. Well, it turns out that Bob is actually plotting with Tommy. How's that for a likely duo? Training Tommy as a dream assassin. So not only will he go into people's dreams, but he can kill people from inside dreams too. Bob's plan is to assassinate the president from inside his dream, because apparently that's going to be less suspicious than the old, you know, reliable kapow. I had to let you know you're in danger. What's going on here, Charlie? Last week I would have laughed at you. I'm not so sure about what's going on. The stakes are a little higher than I imagined. Mr. Blair is playing for keeps. That woman who linked with Tommy Ray didn't just die of a heart attack. What are you saying? I'm saying Blair's a ruthless killer. Norm meets up with Alex again later on to fill him in on more info before conveniently getting snuffed out by the government spook guys. Cheers, Norm. <laughs> We lost him. Yes. I'm afraid he has to be killed. The government spooks know that Alex knows, so there's a chase. In fact, most of this movie's action happens outside the dream world. Look, we have all these 80s chase scene beats. Alex almost getting smashed in a phone booth before he remembers how doors work. And a thrilling series of motorcycle stunts. back to the Dream Research Institute to head off this dastardly plot to assassinate the president from inside his dream. They all go nighty-night and have their dream battle. Mr. President, listen to me. Your life is in danger. Bob Blair is trying to kill you. What the hell are you talking about? He sent somebody into this dream to assassinate you. Who are you? I'm here to help you. Look, all you gotta do is wake up. Wake up? That's right, wake up. Try, concentrate, wake up. They gave me a sedative. 
sedative. Well, we're just going to have to ride this out till it wears off. Impressive marks should be given for the few dream sequences that do happen. At least they were trying a little bit with the finale, but it just feels like a letdown. Dreamscape 1984. This movie is not weird. <laughs> and it really ticks me off. It's very frustrating. Uh, there are some stories out there of executive meddling, and the movie being on shaky legs is one of the first PG-13 rated films released in the U.S. Uh, I believe it was Gremlins that year that was the first one. Uh, but still, an idea from a Zelazny story about government agents battling a dreams that should have at least thrown in a few more weird elements. So why did this come off like it was produced by the Church of Latter-day Saints? Seriously, even when I caught this on cable as a kid, I was disappointed at how many punches this movie pulls. I've read Edge of Your Stories and Highlights magazine. For one problem, for a movie called Dreamscape, almost none of it takes place in a dream. For the dream sets, and the movie points this out, you can do anything! It's a dream, Alex! You can do anything you want in here! The locations are a building, a train, another train, a house, all with mostly ordinary things happening. The one point where the movie gets a little bit creative is in the kid's dream. At least here they gave the house some funky architecture and filled in a little bit of Buddy's psychological profile, especially his relation with his dad. By the time we get to Tommy swinging nunchucks and turning into a snake on the train, it's just too little too late. Dreamscape spends too much time trying to be all things to all viewers. It wants to be a paranoid government thriller, or an action-adventure flick, or an escapist fantasy, or a horror movie. You know that generic motorcycle jump? That right there is the part where they could have been having more dream shenanigans. Then move on, son. Abracadabra. <laughs> <laughs> You sick bastard! Alex, have a heart. <sighs> have a heart, Alex. So by now you're looking at Tommy's cute little one-liner there when he Kelly Ma's the train cop with his razor nails and and you're thinking, oh, they're trying to imitate Freddy Krueger. Wrong, sir. <laughs> As a matter of fact, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street came out three months later after Dreamscape. And the difference is very telling. Look what Nightmare did on a $1.8 million budget, and it's weirder than Dreamscape with a $6 million budget. Dreamscape doubled its money merely, but Nightmare made back 28 times its budget. I'd have to consider what 20th Century Fox just did not care about this movie. The poster screams that. Look at this poster. It's showing a scene that's not even in the movie. Plus, they did it up like an Indiana Jones movie. I guess they expected theater patrons to just go, Duh, an escape capture must be another Indiana Jones sequel. Better go see it. Dreamscape does have a cult following today. It is a cheesy 80s thriller with some fun lines. The actors ham it up all the way around. And for what tiny, pitiful few chances it does take, there's a few mild thrills. It's full of plot holes and makes about as much sense as a screen door in a submarine, but it never takes itself seriously so it stays in its lane. It's satisfying enough for a popcorn munching, dumb fun genre movie. Still, for a movie that came out one year after Brainstorm, you'd think it'd be a little more confident about its ambitions. I would say Dreamscape is a good remake candidate, but in fact we already had the Dreamscape remake already. Uh, that was in 2010. It was called Inception. Really, it's the same premise. It's an espionage thriller taking place in the subconscious world of dreams, blah, 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 with different details in the course of different treatment and vastly different effects. But with a hell of a lot more invention going on than just one runaway train and one snake man. Now, in the absolute logjam of brilliant fantasy movies that all came out in the early to mid-1980s, movies we still talk about today, movies that earned whole franchises. Dreamscape feels like it was a phoned-in after-school special. See it for the fun curiosity piece it is, but as far as weird movies go, weird dreams are not made of these.